And so this is the fourth of a series of four classes on Buddhism in a nutshell. And um, so this is the very last one. And so in Buddhism in a nutshell, if people haven't tuned in earlier, we cover all of Buddhism in four classes, which of course, to do that, we have to, we can't go in great detail, but there is a beauty in this in that you get an overview, you get to see the whole thing. And I, for me, it's very helpful to, be, to see the whole thing. And, um, and so I've always loved that in any subject that I've done. I always try to find an in introduction to any, anything I wanna learn about. Because then, then, then you can fill in all the details and they make sense. So in this class, we, we've, we've already gone through a, a large fraction of stuff. We've gone through the, the introductory stuff of what Buddhism is all about, who Buddha was, what was his life story, what happened to Buddhism when he died. And then we spent, in this course, we spent most of the time talking about the Four Noble Truths. And so now we're gonna to turn to the Mahayana path. And um, so in this class, what we're mainly gonna talk about is three main subjects. And the three main subjects we're gonna talk about are bodhicitta, emptiness, and tantric or Vajrayana Buddhism. And, and so those are the things that I'm going to focus on. Uh, but, probably we'll have lots of questions and I'll end up getting diverted again, <laughs> which is actually absolutely fine. Um, so before we do though, however, I, I just wanna talk about that we, we're following, for this last part of the course, we're following this notion of Lam Rim, which is an organized way of going over all of Buddhism that was brought, I mean, most schools of Buddhism have something similar to this, but this is what the Tibetan version is. And it was started by Atisha around 1000 AD. And he wrote a very small version of this, just sort of almost more of an outline. And Lama Tsongkhapa, who founded the Galupa order of uh, the Tibetan Buddhism, which is the very largest part, it's the part that actually the Dalai Lama belongs to, um, he expanded that enormously. And it's called Lam Rim, which is the Tibetan terminology for it, which means is usually translated as stages of the path. And so this, so this is wonderful because when Buddha taught, he taught in many different subjects. And if you just go through the, the scriptures, it's you're hopping all over the place. And so by having these sort of organized teachings, it's very helpful. And in fact, this way of doing organized teachings began even at the time of Buddha. The senior practitioners of Buddha had the same problem because they had all these young people coming in wanting to follow the Buddha. And so they organized Buddhism also in a uh, organized way. And that was sort of the birth of actually Buddhist philosophy, sometimes called the Abhidharma, the, the higher teaching of Dharma, uh, which is Dharma usually. Dharma means many different, has many different meanings, both in Buddhism and in um, Actually, in Hinduism, Dharma is also a word in Hinduism as well, because it comes from the Sanskrit. But in Buddhism, most of the time you talk about Dharma as being Buddhist teachings. Okay, so the, the one thing I want to say is um, in following uh, Lama Sankapa, he divides, and, and actually following Atisha, they divide sort of the teachings into sort of what they call three scopes. They call the small, intermediate, and great scope. And the way that the Tibetans, well, it was originally Atisha was from India, but uh, originally the, the way of dividing it really is based on your motivation for your spiritual path or sort of your end goal, if you like. So I've been telling you all along that you shouldn't worry about the end goal um, uh, because people get too caught up in it. Because people are always looking for some fast trick. You know, they, they hear about enlightenment and they say, oh, tell me the trick. How can I do it? And then I'll become enlightened right now. And of course, in Buddhism, as I've explained many times, Buddhism is all about cause and effect. And you can only become enlightened if you create all the causes for enlightenment. And that, that actually is a lot of work. That requires a lot. And so Buddhism, as Buddha, as Buddha himself emphasized, is a, is a very broad, continuous path. You approach 
enlightenment step by step over a long period of time, and you do it in a very broad way. And, and actually the, the same thing, and, and, and like I say, I always say focus on right now. You know, really the main thing to focus on is focus on being a better person. And if you do that, everything else will fall into step. So Jay, you have a question? You have your hand raised? Yes, I do. Um, and it's connected to this. I'm just wondering, because yeah. <clears throat> one of the things that strikes me is that when they talk about eons and eons, how does one stay sort of like optimistic? Like it can seem very overwhelming that yeah. there's such a long, long path. So I'm wondering, and I see what you're saying in terms of like, okay, so we focus on being a better person, yeah, and being more aware. But I'm just... it. Yeah, I'm just wondering if anybody else has that problem or how that's addressed. Yeah, no, 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 no. you know, and, and that's part of the reason why I often say, you know, don't focus on the long term, because people do get discouraged when they think about that. And in fact, I'm not really convinced that that's actually true. Uh, when Buddha was alive, he was saying, oh, you know, actually, you can become enlightened. When, well, when Buddha was talking, I'm going to explain different levels of enlightenment. But this is, for him, he was talking about liberation from samsara. But anyway, I'll come back to that. But anyway, Buddha was saying, oh, well, you know, you can actually do this in three months. Or actually, you can do it in just a few days. So the, so the living Buddha didn't seem to always talk about all these eons necessary to become uh, enlightened. Uh, I think part of the reason why where one got all of these eons for becoming enlightened is that for the Buddha himself, he actually took... And he, he relates his own history, which he knew perfectly because he was enlightened. He took many eons, but he took many eons because he was taking a higher path, because he was becoming the Buddha who was teaching all the rest of this Buddhism. So, so, so a Buddha like Buddha Shakyamuni is a very special person. So in the Mahayana teachings, we will also talk actually about all of us becoming a Buddha, but not the same type of Buddha as Buddha Shakyamuni. It's not like we're going to go and illuminate the whole world, but it's sort of that we can achieve the same level, but I'll have to explain that. So yeah, Jay, that, that's a very good question. And the other thing too, is that when I listen to the, um, you know, even when I read the original teachings of the original Buddha and so forth, you know, time to me seems a little strange in all of these teachings. And I'm not sure that we should, that we really understand it as humans, you know, or whether time means the same thing as what we mean by time. So I always take, I, I always think that a lot of these descriptions of eons and I mean, you know, it, it may be maybe a little beyond human understanding. I mean, the Buddha himself does talk about, actually, interestingly enough, compared to modern science, the Buddha talks about going through eight eons of the world expansion and contraction. So it's almost like Buddha is, is talking about modern physics and the modern view of astronomy about the Big Bang and the world exploding and expanding. And at this point in time, science is trying to figure out whether it will keep expanding forever, or actually collapse back again to another Big Bang. But all of these things, I mean, the Buddha always emphasized that he, you know, we shouldn't worry about theory that our goal is, is to stop our suffering. And, and in fact, the Buddha often talked about uh, Buddhist philosophy and views as sort of being a trap. Because usually when we get into, and, and, and his rationale for that, if you read more carefully, is basically most of our views are based on uh, egotistical emotions. It's like, there's certain things we like, so we want that philosophy to be true. <laughs> and then we push it really hard. And whatever things we don't like, we, we, our, our mind tends to say, oh, that must be wrong or something like that. So, and, and, and the problem with most views is that it leads to this sort of engagement with egotism and, 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 you know, and thinking about ourselves. And that's all of the things that causes all of our problems and actually causes most of our suffering. So anyway, I, I, I would not get too hung up on these eons. And, and like, like I say, I, I mean, because, the, you know, for me, what's really important is you want to actually have a good life now. And if you want to have a good life now, what you want to do is you want to practice being a good person. Because if you are a good person, I think you will find that you will 
have a good life now. And, and, if, and if you are a sincere Buddhist, that doesn't mean you won't have difficulties in your life. I mean, you might have even, you know, things like cancer or, you know, all sorts of things that can happen due to your previous karma. But in Buddhism, it's really emphasized that, you know, a really powerful spiritual practitioner can ride all through whatever difficulty arises, they can deal with it. It's not a problem because all difficulties go through your mind. And if you have a strong mind, these difficulties just aren't a problem. And so, so, so Buddhism is all about mind development. And, and that's why I say it's, it's really the foundational parts of Buddhism that are most important. Learning how to remove all the negative, it's the negativities in your mind that make you unhappy. And it's the negativities in your mind that when you do meet with a difficulty, cause you to experience it as painful. You know, and you can see that with various people. With various people, you can see that bad things happen to them and it's just like it bounces off, like they're impervious to it. And other people just completely fall apart. And so, so what's really important is mind training, uh, which, which is actually a, uh, there is actually a, a topic in Mahayana Buddhism called mind training. <laughs> It's, it's, it's sort of a specialized topic within uh, Mahayana Buddhism. And if I have a little time, I'll talk about that. But yeah, I, I mean, I, mean I, I wouldn't worry so much about, that's why I say I wouldn't worry about the time. First, because I'm not sure we really understand it correctly. I'm not sure if time is linear in Buddhism the same way it is. And I think thinking about eons and all of this thing, I think is just sort of beyond the scope of what humans can really understand. So I, 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 so my goal actually in my life is just to become as happy as I can right now, which is to lead the spiritual path in the best way I can. And I think that's the most reasonable approach. And I think, you know, because otherwise you get hung up on this thing. Oh, why, why haven't I become enlightened? I've been, I've been studying for three hours and I'm still not enlightened, that sort of thing. You know what I mean? And, and that, that happens at all stages of the path. And, um, so any, anyway, I'll, I'll just leave it there. So I'll keep Bob, going. I've got one more. Related. Okay, sure, go ahead. Yeah. And I have, <clears throat> like I've heard Bob Thurman, for instance, say, and, and I have a thing about this. I mean, the term happiness. Yes. It, it, isn't it more like, um, it, it should be more like satisfaction or progression or, you know, all of us, the, the key thing that we're seeking is to have a fulfilled life. And happiness for many of us does not capture that concept because it sounds to me like, I'm afraid I always use the analogy of McDonald's Happy Meal. You know, it, it feels rather frivolous. Yes. Can you say yes. something about that? Yes, absolutely. And that's absolutely true. And, uh, you know, and I, and, and I think the correct way to think about this is that there are different levels of happiness of what we call I mean happiness is a you know it's a very very broad term that means many different things in many different contexts and in fact if you read you know if you go through and read what Buddha actually taught to people he was always complaining and complaining is maybe even not the right word he was always warning against samsaric pleasure which is the main thing that people think about as happiness so when people think about happiness, you know, they think about, I don't know, living in some sort of godlike realm, you know, where you can have sex all the time and it's wonderful. You can have all the best foods, you know, that they think about sensual pleasures as being the goal. And so what they think of as uh, happiness is essentially only having samsaric pleasure and never experiencing any sort of pain or disease or mental anxiety or anything like that. And, uh, and actually the reason why the Buddha actually talked against samsaric pleasure is because it gets caught up in one of the, what are sometimes called the three poisons, the three negativities in our mind that cause us to do negative actions. And these three are basically lust or greed, hatred, and the third one is actually delusion. But samsaric pleasure always gets caught up in lust or greed. 
And it's that desire for samsaric pleasures that often cause a lot of people to do a lot of negative things, you know, bank robbers and people who steal money from people trying to, to get as much money as possible because they want to buy big yachts and have fabulous dinners and big houses and all that sort of stuff. And in fact, the, the Buddha had a, a beautiful analogy about this, about samsaric pleasure. He said, think of samsaric pleasure as spreading honey on the edge of a very, very sharp knife and try to lick the honey off of it. So licking the honey off of it is like getting experiencing the samsaric pleasure. And the danger of it is, is how can you lick that honey off without cutting this sharp edge that's right next to it? And the sharp edge that you cut that right next to it is creating negative karma in our greed and lust for, for samsaric pleasure. So, so that's one way of looking, beginning to start to look at this happiness or pleasure. But there's actually, I think, an, a deeper level and the deeper level, which you learn about as you sort of probe Buddhism more deeply, is that there is there is something which you might call spiritual pleasure. And I, you know, I, I've never, I don't think I've ever heard it quite the word spiritual pleasure used quite right that exactly in that way. But I'll explain what I mean. Um, I think maybe the best way is is that for people who meditate. Uh, the Buddha described very high levels of meditations, which he called jhanas. In Sanskrit, it's called jhana. But these are things where you, you, you go into extraordinarily deep meditative, meditative states. And what all the people who do deep meditation ultimately discover is deep meditation is extraordinarily blissful, amazingly blissful, far more blissful than anything in samsaric pleasure. And, and actually, Lama Yesha, who, who himself was a very deep meditator and was one of the, the two people, him and Lama Zopa, who created this network, the FPMT centers that's hosting these talks. Uh, unfortunately, he's dead now, but he's a wonderful person. He could do these deep meditations, and he always used to talk about that. You know, he would say, oh, <clears throat> you know, if the ordinary person discovered this, they wouldn't even care about sex or food or anything else. They'd go nuts over meditating. And in fact, that sometimes happens to people. Sometimes people do go nuts over meditation. You know, it becomes almost like an addiction, uh, which is good in one sense, but it's bad in another sense because it's not the goal. And in fact, sometimes they say that, you know, when you start reaching very high levels of spiritual practice and you do these deep meditations and usually to acquire these sort of deep pleasures, I mean, you, you can't usually just do it with a short meditation. These are things where you might have to, take months on retreat or something like that, specifically directed toward these side of kind of accomplishments. So this, these are very difficult things to acquire, but these powerful bliss that you acquire is just amazing. So that, that's the sort of bliss that I'm talking about as the more spiritual bliss. Uh, and, and, and you can get it in other ways through uh, spiritual practice, but, but anyway, um, and, and, and in fact, I think just as an illustration, you know, we were talking about, are there different levels of happiness? If you're talking about meditative happiness, uh, when the Buddha was alive, he described these jhanas and he described, she described them as actually having three levels of happiness. So there's, there's a level of happiness called pity uh, or piti. Uh, which is, a, again, a Sanskrit word, which means actually a sort of a bodily bliss and a sort of the lo lowest form of bliss that you get in meditation. And then there's a higher form of bliss that's called sukha, which is more refined. It's more in your mind. But it's said that when you experience the sukha at very deep level, you look back at the pity type of bliss or happiness that you were getting earlier. Sometimes these, they, they keep using different words like bliss, rapture, to describe these forms of happiness. But they say, oh, the pity, when they look back from somebody who has sukha, they look back at this earlier form and they say, oh, well, that's sort of gross. You know, it's not, it's not refined. It's not as pure, as perfect as this sukha that I'm experiencing. And then the higher form of happiness or bliss actually is uh, eupexia, equanimity, which is said to be not even 
not necessarily happiness in the way that we would think of pleasure. I mean, it's so highly refined and so delicate that it's, you know, it's hard to describe, but it has to do with sort of not being, being completely balanced in your mind. But they say that the refinement of that state is so amazingly wonderful that it makes even the bliss of the sukha appear sort of coarse and not so great. So, it's, 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 so, so maybe that's the way of, I don't know if that helps you, Jay, is, is explaining that happiness, you have to sort of look at it in different ways. Yeah, okay, I got it. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, okay. So, so anyway, um, so again, continuing along with this lamb rim. So this lamb rim, as they describe it, is uh, again, there's small, intermediate, and great scope, and it's just based on your objective. So the small scope people are the people who learn about rebirth, karma, things like that. And when they learn about that, then they think, oh, you know, what's going to happen to me when I die? And so their major concern is to lead a good life, a moral life, produce lots of good positive karma, reduce their negative karma. So whenever they're, they are reborn, they will be reborn in a good state and enjoy, enjoy more pleasure, more, more happiness in their future life of whatever form. Uh, and, and in this sense, happiness meaning the opposite of suffering or pain, maybe that's the best way in this context to describe happiness. So that's the small scope. Uh, in terms of samsaric pleasure, that's not even described on any of these three scopes because that's considered to be the same thing that the animals have. So it said, you know, animals are, are concerned about just eating well, having food, sex, samsaric pleasures. So it said that, that if all you care about is samsaric pleasures or sensual pleasures, you're basically at the state of an animal, you're not even on the spiritual path. So anyway, that's, that's, anyway, that's what they say. I'll just leave it at that. So anyway, so we had that, the small scope, better rebirth. And then the intermediate scope is what was in the original form of Buddhism that Buddha taught. And this is liberation from samsara. So this is where you purify all of your negative states of mind. And it requires acquiring great emptiness, uh, which in different contexts means different things. And the original Buddhism, it really meant a deep, really deep understanding of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, in the Mahayana Buddhism, it basically relates to having a deep understanding of emptiness, which is what I'm going to talk about later in this class. Okay, so anyway, but anyway, you need this in order to liberate yourself from samsara. And then when you liberate yourself from samsara, you're never reborn in any of these various states, heaven, hells, human animals, you're never reborn anywhere in samsara and you live in sort of eternal bliss. So it's very clear that this, uh, and this is called achieving nirvana. And the Buddha makes it very clear that this nirvana has a far greater bliss than anything we experience inside, inside of samsara. It's sort of like taking these deep, the blisses that you get in these deep meditative states and sort of extrapolating them to infinity, thinking about, and I think that's the best way of doing it. And so the state of nirvana, I mean, we really can't even talk about it because it's beyond any experience that we have. The closest thing we can talk about in terms of nirvana is perhaps some of these very deep meditative states, because that's probably about as close as we can get to it. But from the Buddha's description, it's very clear that whatever it is, it's far better than even that. So that's the goal of the intermediate scope. And then we finally come to the great scope, uh, which is what Mahayana Buddhism is all about. And that is where we focus on bodhicitta and achieving what's called a higher enlightenment. So in the Mahayana path, the, uh, and I will come and explain what bodhicitta and these things are, but in the higher Mahayana path, uh, the goal is to become at the same level of Buddha. Not in the sense that we become a Buddha that we're gonna enlighten the whole world in the same way Buddha, but basically we have done additional purifications, which are, you know, just the, these, like I say, I, I gave the analogy before that if you think about taking some garlic, closing it up in a really tight lid and a tight 
container and then you take the garlic out taking the garlic out is like removing the, the negativities of your mind but there's a faint smell of them left over and that's what the what you need it's sort of the equivalent of that faint smell that you have to remove to go from simple liberation or nirvana or achieving liberation from samsara to this higher state of full buddhahood okay so now um so i would say that up to the intermediate scope basically the the early form of buddhism and the mahayana path are basically the same but this is what part of what the mahayana do does is expanding this and and maybe this is again where you get these great eons because you know it was said the buddha went through great eons to become a buddha so if we're going to follow him into buddhahood then you start thinking oh well maybe i need many eons in order to uh, become a full buddha and however the opposite of that or the opposing point of view is the last topic, which is Tantric or Vajrayana Buddhism. Because Tantric or Vajrayana Buddhism, these are just two synonyms for the same thing. This is said, called, often called the quick path to enlightenment. And it's said that this is the way to achieve enlightenment in this very lifetime, in a very short time, depending on how intensely you practice it. So, so, so if you don't want to go through, so if you want full Buddhahood, but you don't want to go through all these eons of work, then you need tantric or Vajrayana practice according to the Tibetan scheme of things. Okay, so, so now let me move on. Um, so the beginning path, I spent a long time in this particular course, and through all the questions, I, I, I think I covered the whole thing that I would normally cover in this space. So I'm going to skip over so that we can finish. And um, so what I want to now do is focus on bodhicitta, the Mahayana path. So in the Mahayana path, um, I might have, I forget what I've said before, but I might have said this before. There are additional Buddhist scriptures that come into play when you move to the Mahayana path. And the Mahayana path began sometime around the birth of Christ, maybe a little bit before. And around that time, various Mahayana sutras appeared. So as I said before, uh, the sutra really, in the original context, meant uh, is basically a recording of the specific teachings that the Buddha gave. So the Buddha would go to this city and he would give this teaching and they would record it. And then they write, and it was originally memorized and repeated orally for a few centuries. And then it was written down. And so those various teachings are what we call the sutras. And, then, and they can be of various lengths, some very long, some of them just even a few paragraphs. So they, but, but they're called sutras, uh, which is part of the Indian terminology. And so at the time when Mahayana path started, Mahayana sutras started appearing. And so from a Western perspective, it, it looks a little shaky because we say, well, how come these weren't there originally? <laughs> Why did they only appear 500 years later? And the Mahayanas have various explanations. Some of them are very mythological. They talk about mythological creatures called Nagas who hid them for 500 years. <laughs> uh, but I, I don't know, maybe the, the best explanation I've sort of liked is what uh, Geshe Sherab at our center talk. He, he says that he, he's, you can also take it as being just inspired by the Buddha, that maybe people having studied Buddhism for 500 years, people were now ready to go on a higher path. At any rate, uh, these are very profound teachings. And, and based on these teachings, this whole Mahayana school. And as I say, historically, in terms of the spread of Buddhism, it's really this Mahayana type of teachings that really took off. In the original days around, you know, around 0 AD, when these things were first started coming, it was very common to have um, in the monasteries, it was very common for Mahayana and non-Mahayana or Theravadan or Hinayana practitioners to all mix in the same monastery. And for me, that this, this seems very natural because the Mahayana path, after all, was the path that Buddha taught, went through. And so to me, it's just sort of, uh, if you like, it's the same path as the original path, but it just adds sort of like a different emphasis. It adds this emphasis of actually trying to reach higher, to go further. 
And as I will explain as, uh, pretty soon now, when I start getting into bodhicitta, there are very powerful arguments about how helpful bodhicitta is in sort of really driving our spiritual life in a very deep, profound way. It, it, it adds a very powerful motivation, which can be very helpful, even if you're following the original path. And basically, as I said, it's, it's really, in a sense, part of the original path, because it, it's, it's the original Buddha taught about loving kindness and compassion. He emphasized that very strongly. And this is loving kindness and compassion are the things that, if you like, the Mahayana sort of emphasizes even more strongly. So, 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 so for, in my mind, when you think about the Mahayana path, I think the best way to think about it is that it's part of the same original Buddhism, but it just adds a different emphasis and it sort of elevates the goal, the goal becoming to actually achieve even higher purifications. And even the Theravadins or the Hinayana practitioners, I mean, they, they were very clear at the time of Buddha that the Buddha was a more powerful being than the people who changed uh, Arhat or Arhat, depending on which language you're in, Pali or Sanskrit. It was very clear that the people who achieved only the Arhat status uh, were not at the same level as Buddha. The Buddha had omniscience and greater powers, uh, knew more, was a more powerful being. So, and, and, and the Buddha actually did refer to himself in the original Buddhist scriptures as part of his earlier life being a Bodhisattva path, which is what in the Mahayana path, we talk about, so in the Mahayana path, all the people who have full enlightenment as their goal, we call them bodhisattvas. So all of this is sort of, I would say, you know, not such a big break as sometimes people make it out to be. But anyway, the Mahayana Buddhas, almost Zen, uh, all the Buddhism that spread to China, all the various things in Japan, uh, Tibet, Pretty much almost all the Buddhism that spread around the world, except for the original Theravadan schools that were in uh, places like Sri Lanka, Thailand, places like that. Almost all the schools today, the vast majority of practitioners, Buddhist practitioners today are Mahayanas. Okay. And, and certainly in the Tibetan tradition, which is what our center is coming from, it's definitely Mahayana, you know, very heavily so. Okay, so, so, so let's talk about bodhicitta. So bodhicitta is the really the, the key driving force in the Mahayana school. And so it's best just to state it. So, so what bodhicitta means is it means that your goal is to become a full Buddha. But your motivation for becoming a Buddha it's not just because, I don't know, you want to be better than those arhats or something like that. You're more pure. You know, it's, it's not as though it's a, you know, this, uh, you know, everybody's competing. It's not a big, it's not like you're, you're competing and showing off that you're better or something like that. It's, it's not for that. The, the main the reason for achieving full enlightenment is because you're bothered by all of sentient beings who are suffering pain. And in fact, your motivation is is that you can't stand the fact that other sentient beings, meaning beings with a mind, are suffering. It's just unbearable to you. And because it is so unbearable to you, what you end up doing is making a definite decision that you have no choice. You've got to fix this problem. You yourself have to do something to make it better and reduce all the other suffering in our samsaric world. So, so, that's, so that's sort of the main idea of bodhicitta. And you can ask yourself, why is this so powerful? And, um, and I think there's different levels that you can talk about it. Uh, one thing that makes it really powerful is that it's an altruistic. It's a focus on others. And, and why is that so important? Uh, the reason why that is so important is because it's our egotism that causes all our present suffering. So even if you're on the original path, our main problem is that we are so focused on ourselves 
and our own pleasures and what happens to us, but that's what motivates or drives us to accomplish all, to do all of this negative karma and to, and drives us to, it enhances all of these negative states of mind, like greed, hatred, and delusion. And, uh, and so, so if you have this powerful motivation to be altruistic, it's it really, I mean, it's like putting your spiritual practice on steroids. I mean, it's just so, so powerful. And so, you know, and I talked about, I mean, earlier, I talked about my favorite practice, which is just seeing people around you and saying, you know, I wish that you were happy. I wish that you never have to suffer again, which is an altruistic motive. And it's actually part of the original, it's called the Brahma Vihara teachings of the original Buddha. And it's said by the original Buddha, it's almost said it's the most powerful merit generating thing that you can do. So the Buddha clearly talked about altruistic. But if you do that, you can just examine your own mind and you discover it makes you happy. You know, and, and there is this thing we said, I mean, we see this people who are parents that have children. I mean, parents just feel ecstatic when their children are happy. And even though there's a lot of self-serving in that, it's our children, maybe we don't feel so happy about some other children, but nonetheless, it's that same sort of thing. When we actually rejoice in other people's happiness, you can just sense how happy it makes us. And so that's the irony of Mahayana Buddhism, that in order to, for yourself to become the happiest person in the world, all you gotta do is focus on the happiness of others. And while you're focusing on the happiness of the others, as sort of a just accidental by fall, fallout. It's not, well, it's not accidental, but it is sort of a fallout of that. The end result is that you make yourself perfectly happy. So, so there, there are a lot of these sort of ironies in Buddhism. And, and that's sort of the, you know, I think what makes this Mahayana path so extraordinarily powerful. So, that, so that's one part of the view. It's getting dark out. Okay. So, so that's one asp one way of looking at it, which is very, very powerful and um, important. I think there's another way of looking at it, which uh, in I mean, especially the in the Tibetan schools, they talk about this other way a lot. And this is this notion of merit. And so, this when I first started studying Buddhism, I always wondered, what is this merit? <laughs> How does it relate to karma? And eventually it became very clear that merit means good karma. <laughs> so that that's, took me years to discover that. Or I, I always sort of thought it might, but I never saw anybody say it for a long time. But anyway, merit means good karma. And of course, the other idea, way to become happy is generate tons of positive karma. And, and posit, you know, positive karma makes you feel good in the moment. But as it ripens, it also makes you feel good in future moments. And so you can ask yourself, um, uh, you know, if, if I'm going to generate, how can I? So, so, so you can ask yourself, it's a good goal to generate positive karma, positive karma. And uh, so these Brahma Baharas, as I said, the Buddha talked about this wishing happiness and which there's actually four of them, but I won't go into the other two because it takes more explanation, even though they're very simple. But anyway, the first, you know, just wishing other people to be happy and not to suffer. Uh, but if you have bodhicitta, essentially you're doing the same thing. Um, you're wishing, you know, it sort of incorporates that. So when, you, when you're on this path of focused on others, essentially you're creating tons of good positive karma. And I think one way of looking at it is that in bodhicitta, which I'll explain a little more extensively in a few minutes, but in bodhicitta, the goal is not the wish to remove the suffering of just your relatives, your kids, your spouse, your parents, and not just your friends, not just the people you like, but it's, it's universal. So true bodhicitta is the wish to remove all the suffering of every single sentient being without exception. Without exception, it's universal. And so the way to think about this is that if, if you're practicing with the goal of 
helping one person. You know, you see some person, you know, in a store or something that's struggling and you go up to them and, and you try to help them or you, I don't know, maybe, maybe you, you see some insect that's about to drown or suffer and you save them. You know, whenever you do anything positive, you know, you can think of generating a certain amount of positive karma. So if you help two people, you should, in principle, generate twice as much merit. Three people, three times. But if you have this goal of doing whatever your spiritual practice is, if you have this motivation of every moment of your life doing your practice to benefit all sentient beings, infinite, practically infinite number of sentient beings, then at each moment in your life, you're generating practically an infinite amount of merit. And so that's why it just pushes you. I mean, it just gives you this huge push toward enlightenment. And, um, and, 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 and so it's so, so powerful. Now, the, the one little tricky thing, uh, I should mention this, because oftentimes people don't talk about it, is what is the relationship between the normal liberation from samsara, the small enlightenment, so-called in the Mahayana path, and the great enlightenment of full Buddhahood. Uh, you know, if you do all of this push with all this bodhicitta, aren't you going to become liberated from samsara and then just sort of disappear into nirvana? And so that's a little tricky part, which I think most people sort of finesse. But anyway, the answer is, is that in the Mahayana path, what you do is when you acquire enough merit to become fully liberated from samsara, you voluntarily choose not to disappear into nirvana, but to, but to keep being reborn over and over again until you can go through this additional purification process to reach full Buddhahood. So that's so there is this thing of uh, that sometimes you see little small references to this, and it's hard to understand. But but you have to to, to recognize that uh, in the Mahayana path, you deliberately normally for all of us on our normal path, we are reborn in samsara because our karma forces us to be reborn in samsara, and we go wherever our karma directs us. For a being at this high level, they can actually wreck themselves where they're reborn in samsara. And they will often choose wherever they think is most helpful. But anyway, for the Mahayana, you stay in samsara until you reach full Buddhahood. <laughs> so anyway, just a small point. But I think it's helpful because sometimes you, you run across these things. Okay, so, so that's sort of the, the idea of the Mahayana path. And uh, there are... Uh, different levels of bodhicitta, and and basically the reason why there's it's it's interesting in all different things. There's always different levels of everything in Buddhism. <laughs> Even in these deep meditative states, they have preparatory stages and then the full stage. So in everything in Buddhism, there's almost always some sort of preparatory stage and then the full blown thing. And it's the same way of bodhicitta. Sort of the preparatory thing is what they call aspiring bodhicitta. So that's people like us who decide, okay. I get it. I think that this bodhicitta goal is wonderful. I'm going to go for it. I'm, I'm going to set my goal for becoming full enlightenment until I can enlighten all sentient beings for the goal of reducing the, of getting, eliminating the suffering of all sentient beings. However, when you do that, even though you have this goal, you know, this goal is not that solid. I mean, it's just basically an idea. And for all of us, we know how flimsy our ideas are. You know, we, we like this today, we don't like it tomorrow. It's not a stable form of bodhicitta. So, so, so it's called aspiring bodhicitta, but it's a good thing. I mean, it's the thing that everybody has to go through to acquire a full bodhicitta. So it's a very, very important step, step in which you should not denigrate it in any way. However, it's just, it's just worthwhile knowing that there is a higher level of bodhicitta, which is actually the, if you like, the full realization or attainment or actual accomplishment of bodhicitta, which is a very stable, which is the stable form of bodhicitta, that once you get that, you never, you never leave it. And, and, and when you have this full form of bodhicitta, it requires, it, it, it's, 
as you might expect, it's not a small thing. It's a huge accomplishment. And in fact, it requires, uh, first, it's said that, in, at least in the normal scheme of things, you have to acquire a very deep meditative state, which is called um, shamatha or calm abiding. So it requires acquiring a very deep meditative state, uh, which is not easy to do, but people do it all the time. I mean, any of us could do it if we really set our mind on it. You might have to do a long retreat or something like that. But anyway, this calm abiding um, essentially gives you a very powerful mind. And it's only if you have a mind of that power that you can accomplish the, the actual realization of full bodhicitta. And then with that very powerful mind, uh, at that point, you can then progress to acquiring full bodhicitta, uh, sometimes called spontaneous. When you have full bodhicitta, it's spontaneous. It's there continuously. So if you have the full realization of bodhicitta, you think your motivation is bodhicitta every moment of your life, awake, asleep, it's spontaneous, it's there, you can't stop it. It's so, it just runs completely through you. Okay, but, but, but to get there, you have to start with this preliminary practice. Okay, so um, in earlier courses, I actually go through a very detailed description of how you achieve bodhicitta because it's like everything in bodhicitta it's just not going to fall out of the sky and hit you you actually have to go through a practice you have to acquire the causes and conditions to have bodhicitta and 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 actually the it, it's actually quite interesting to describe the path because you see it as it's a logical step by step it's really a mind training where you're Training your mind to think in a different way. And in fact, if you look sort of at almost all Buddhist practice, almost all Buddhist practice are very similar. Almost all of them are a similar type of mind training. Training your mind to just think in a different way than your, the way you habitually think. And, and, and so there, in the Mahayana path, there are two well-known ways of following for bodhicitta. Uh, the first is the extensive way, and that's sort of for beginners. And then there's a more uh, sophisticated way, which is said to be used by people who maybe achieved bodhicitta in previous lives, so it's familiar to them. So when they take up bodhicitta training in this life, they can sort of skip a lot of the, the, the small steps and sort of make a great leap forward. So I'm just going to quickly describe, not in great deal, as detail as I often do in this course, but just what the steps are. So the first one, which is the more detailed step-by-step uh, -step approach is called sevenfold cause and effect. And that's because there's seven steps to it. <laughs> and so the first step is, um, again, where we're trying to develop this sort of altruistic mind, this mind that focuses on other. And so the first step is just developing what they call equanimity feeling the same about people. So you do specific meditations to make you think, oh, you know, we're all the same. You know, it's like, uh, I should not dislike you or love you. We should all sort of be on the same level. I should have a sort of an even keel in my relationship with other people. And then from there, you, you go through a very curious step. You, you think that all living beings are mothers. And this is like a trick to get you to develop affection for all other beings. And in a sense, it's true because uh, the Buddha said he could not see any beginning to our, our series of rebirths. And so if there is a almost infinite, you know, large but finite number of people, not infinite, but a very large number, if we, if we had an infinite number of lives at some point, in our deep, deep, distant path, all of them at some point must have been our mothers. And if you think about someone being your mother, uh, you think, oh, you know, we all have affection for our mothers, especially if it's a good mother. And if you had an infinite number of paths, each of these people at some point must have been a good mother. <laughs> Sometimes people 
think they have bad mothers now, but we won't get into it. But anyway, it's that notion. It's, 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 it's a trick to try to get you. And But actually, in a sense, it's not a trick because it's true. We all probably, every sentient being has been our mother. You know, And if your mother dies in this life and you've had a good mother, you don't stop loving your mother just because she's dead. So why should you stop loving these previous mothers, even if they've been a billion lifetimes before? So, so it's that same rationale. So it's this idea of actually we should think, we should actually feel affection for every sentient being because everyone we meet has in some way in some past life been wonderful to us. And there's actually a, a solid basis, a solid reason to actually feel affection. And um, so, so anyway, that, that's sort of, the, and you go through meditations working on this, and then you extend the meditation, the mother meditation, you, rem, you remember the kindness of mother beings. So you remember the kindness of mothers you've had that have been wonderful to you. And then, and then once you develop that, you, you know, if you've, especially if you've had a good mother in this life, there's a sense that we owe a debt to them. They were so wonderful to us. And they didn't have to be just out of the goodness of their heart. They were wonderful to us. And so we have a debt to sort of repay that kindness. And the way you repay that kindness is by being kind to them. And so that's the way that people who have good mothers in their old age often go to great lengths to take care of their mothers. And so you, so you develop meditations focused on that. And again, thinking, equating mothers with all the other beings, it gives you this notion of developing affection for everyone you meet in the street. It gives you a reason for developing this affection. And then um, once you develop affection for people, if there's people that you really like or feel affection for, if they suffer, it's terrible for you. You know, I, I mean, you can think about a parent. If a parent, whenever a parent sees their child suffering, it's horrible, absolutely horrible for a parent to, to see their, their child suffering. It's because they have this deep love for their child. So if we have people that we deeply love and we see them suffer, you know, it's like we can't stand it. You know, there's this heroic cases where, you know, some child is drowning in a lake or the ocean and parents that can't even swim will just sacrifice their lives trying to save their children. It's that sort of uh, strong emotion. So these are really powerful emotions. And if you do these meditations right, you start to develop this powerful meditation of affection and, all, and what compassion is defined, compassion is defined to be uh, wishing to stop the suffering of others. So when you have compassion for something, it means you see somebody suffering and you wish to stop it, put a stop to that suffering. So, so through this, through these various meditations, eventually you reach a point where actually you have great compassion. And by great, the, the great and great compassion means everyone without exception. So if you develop, so if you really do this work and progress through these series of meditative steps and process, at the end of it, you can't help yourself. You know, you just feel enormous compassion for everybody. You don't wish anybody to ever suffer. And so, so at that point, now, now here's where the point where bodhicitta really takes off. So, so, so we've developed this great compassion, but this next step is, is really the, uh, the really key step. At that point, you feel that compassion, that wish to relieve the suffering of all other sentient beings so powerful that you develop intention. And this intention is that I myself am gonna do something about this. I'm not going to wait for Buddha or some other great Dalai Lama or somebody else to work on the save these people. I, I can't stand the suffering. And, I, and it bothers me so much that I'm going to do everything I can to work uh, to relieve their suffering. And then once you reach that stage, then the next stage you say, well, how am I going to do this? You know, I'm just this puny human, you know, I'm not this, I'm not the Dalai Lama. I don't have any great powers or anything. How can I do anything to relieve? You know, there's billions of people on the earth. How can I affect them? And then you realize that powerful spiritual people, I mean, the Dalai Lama, I think is a wonderful example of it. 
have enormous influence for good. They help enormous numbers of people in extraordinary ways. And so once you start thinking like that, you think, ah, well, you know, that's the only path forward. I have to become a great spiritual being. And so how do I, what is, what is the most powerful spiritual being in the whole universe? It's a Buddha. It's a perfectly pure being. That's what gives the power to great spiritual beings is their purity. And Buddha natures are Buddhas, people who have the most, are the most pure, purer than people who have even achieved liberation from samsara. And so then you naturally develop the goal, I have to become a Buddha. And I'm going to become a Buddha because it's the only way that I can really help all these people. You know, a Buddha has, inf if you are a full Buddha, you have infinite power. So you have the power. So you, it's only someone with infinite powers that has the power to actually help every single sentient being and work on them. And as I said before, you know, even though Buddhas have infinite powers, they can't save everybody. They can't give a blessing and liberate, cause other people to become enlightened. Because the problem with enlightenment is, is that our own minds, it's our own negativities of our own minds. And only we can change our mind. So the Buddha's path has always been, and this is what the original Buddha said. The original Buddha said, you know, I'm here to teach you. And I'm going to show you how to become enlightened. Just the same. You know, I'm going to teach you the path I followed. And if you follow it, you can take it, eliminate all your suffering and be perfectly happy just the way I am. But I cannot enlighten you. I can only teach you. And so when we become full Buddhas, we develop this notion that we have to, uh, you know, that, that we, what we do is we work to help every sentient being. And so, again, uh, sometimes in various teachings, this becomes a, a little bit vague. How does, how does this work? <laughs> so if the Buddha can't enlighten it, how can they help us? And, and the, the way that this is said, there's actually a beautiful analogy that's often used in the Mahayana Buddhism, which I really like, and I, I usually, I think, teach every time I teach this course. And I think the way to think about it is, the image is think that you have this small house with doors and shutters that you're living inside, and you have the sun shining down on this. So the sun is Buddha shining his blessings, trying, shining his help in whatever way he could help down upon this house. And we're sitting inside this house. So if we close all the windows and doors, we're going to be in total darkness. We're not going to get any of these rays of sun from the sun. And so we're not going to get any benefit from the Buddha. And so for people like that, they've shut themselves off from spiritual teachings and they don't get help. And so the goal in the spiritual life is to throw open the shutters, throw open the doors, open skylights, let as much of the sunlight stream into us. And if we do that, we create the karmic potential to receive the help. So, so we have to do action from our side to benefit from the blessings of Buddha. But if you lead a spiritual life, it's like you create the karmic causes and conditions to receive these blessings and to receive this help from all of the Buddhas. And so that's usually the sort of roughly the way that it's taught in the Mahayana schools to receive. The, so it's a different way of looking at the spiritual life. And, 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 and so the Buddhas are trying to help, but we have to, so the, so the Buddhas create one, and the Buddhas create causes and conditions from their previous life. Uh, to, to benefit people because they create infinite merit while they are in samsaric life. And, and, and so, the, so the goal for us is to connect to the Buddhas, to receive these blessings. And in fact, that's what a lot of that, there's a lot of religious ceremonies in Mahayana Buddhism, especially Tibetan Buddhism, less in Zen and things like that. But in Mahayana Buddhism, there's a lot of religious ceremonies. And there's sort of several purposes for that. One of the purpose is it's a way of generating positive merit. You're doing spiritual practice. And, and the other thing is, 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 is that in these religious ceremonies, you actually should stay awake and pay attention to the words because the words are actually Buddhist teachings. And so it's a way of reminding yourself of the 
core Buddhist teachings while you're in these religious ceremonies. And that in itself creates positive merit. And, um, but the other thing that happens is a lot of these religious ceremonies in Mahayana Buddhism connect the various types of Buddhas, uh, Tara, there's different types of Buddhist deities in the Mahayana path. Besides the original Buddha, there are other uh, enlightened Buddha beings, uh, Tara, Manjushri, uh, all sorts of things like that. And, and, and in some of these ceremonies, uh, they are ways of connecting to these Buddhas so we can receive the blessings from these Buddhas. So we do our karmic part to receive their blessings. So anyway, that, that's part of, I, again, I don't have time to really explain it in Greek. So anyway, that, that's just one way of looking at it. I don't know if it's helpful or not. Okay, so then, okay, so at this point, you know, we've developed this great intention and then if we have these deep meditative states, you know, we, we very quickly, we develop this full bodhicitta. And then we become what's known as a bodhisattva. We become a precious being. It's said that we're like gold because, you know, anybody around us is just, you know, we become a, when you develop this bodhicitta, you become a powerful spiritual being. And everyone around you benefits from it if they can connect to you. And so you benefit all the friends, everyone you meet, you know, it's, it's, you become this powerful being. And at that point, your goal is to work on what's known. Um, is what's known as the six perfections. So, so, so at this point, when you're a bodhisattva, you, you keep purifying yourself. And it's said that there are six main practices that you do uh, to purify yourself. And these six are generosity, giving, and you give them different ways. It can be material things, but especially for powerful beings, it's often teaching Dharma is probably the most powerful gift you can give somebody. So, so giving is one morality, of course, is natural, uh, which means not harming. If you're a bodhicitta, if you have bodhicitta and your goal is to relieve the pain of every the suffering of every single being. There's no way you could harm anyway. So you are going to lead a perfectly moral life. And in doing that, you generate huge amounts of positive karma, especially if you have this bodhicitta motivation as you're doing it. Uh, the next one is patience, never reacting in anger or retaliating against anybody that ever does harm to you. I mean, again, a bodhisattva, even if somebody you know, chops off your head, stabs you with a knife. There's no way that you can ever feel negative toward them. You have total love and compassion for everybody, even if they're doing terrible things to you, because you realize that they're just being driven by their delusions, their afflictions, these clashes, these negative states of mind. And you have compassion for them, and you wish to help help them, give them teachings so they can remove these negativities from their mind. Uh, and then joyous effort. All bodhisattvas, they, you know, they are so driven by this goal of becoming fully enlightened to benefit all sentient beings as fast as possible. That they put enormous, almost infinite amounts of effort into their spiritual practice day and night. They never start practice and it's joyful. I mean, it makes them so happy to further develop their spiritual practice because they think about how wonderful it is if they can more quickly benefit and help people. And then concentration or meditation is certainly one has a powerful mind. And if you've developed full bodhicitta, you've already developed uh, calm abiding, this enormously concentrated state of mind. And it's very easy to go even to higher states of mind. And, um, and in fact, in the original Buddhism, the, the original Buddhism, it was said that there's three main paths to achieving sort of the small enlightenment or liberation from samsara, the Buddha said, and these three were renunciation, uh, concentration or meditation, synonymous, and um, basically uh, um, wisdom or insight or vipassana, which in the Mahayana becomes meditations on emptiness. So it's those three things and the original thing. So in the Mahayana path, uh, actually, renunciation means just the wish to become liberated from samsara. So just to follow the spiritual path. So all of these earlier things like generosity, morality, patience, joyous effort are part of the 
wish to achieve liberation from samsara. Uh, it's sometimes, I mean, what it, what it basically is, is, is that this is a form of morality. So I actually, I, I, to say it correctly, it's the, for the original Buddha, it's morality, concentration, and wisdom are the three things you need to achieve. And within the six perfections, uh, everything is basically morality, non-harming, uh, and, 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 and the positive aspect of morality is just wishing to benefit people, loving kindness, if you like, is a positive way of, of looking at morality from a positive point of view, instead of just not doing bad things. <laughs> So anyway, that's says, so and and then and then of course these last two perfections, concentration or meditation, is the same thing as the original Buddhism, and wisdom is basically the same thing, except that the in the Mahayana schools they they have more refined notions of some of the what wisdom is and so forth. But we'll get into that soon. Okay, so that's so that's the Bodhisattva practice. There is this other mind training, which I'm not going to have time to describe, sometimes called Tonglen, or taking and giving. And this was a thing that said to be such a powerful practice that it could even cure leprosy, which is some of the main monks who were developing this practice. And this is a refined notion of compassion. But what, the, what it does, what it is simply, in just five words or so, is it's just you develop when you're practicing this Tong Len, what you are practicing, which is a Tibetan terminology, but uh, but what you are practicing when you do this mind training is basically in its simplest form. It, again, it's broader teachings that you can get. Whole books are written on this. But in its simplest form, you you imagine in your mind taking in all of the negativities of other people who are suffering in some way and taking in your imagination, taking them upon yourself. And usually do, you do the visualization in the form of black smoke entering the top of your head and it comes down and it helps destroy your egotistical mind. So you do that imagination and you actually imagine removing the suffering of these people. And then when you, and you often do this with breathing, you breathe in their suffering, you breathe out Pures of white wisdom light blessings that give them joy and happiness, spiritual joy and happiness, these very higher forms of, of spiritual happiness, and to replace their suffering. And, um, and, and so that's basically what the practice is. And it's a very powerful practice. I practice it myself. This is a practice I go to in dire times. There was once when my daughter got lost in a ski slope and spent the night. I worried that she might get killed. And so the way I practice it is I imagine all other parents who might've lost their child, taking on all of their suffering and in return giving them all of this perfect happiness of myself. And it's so powerful because first of all, you, start, you stop thinking, oh, poor me, all this terrible thing is happening to me. You, you develop this altruistic mind, which immediately brings you happiness. And by doing this practice, I was able to sleep that night. Uh, it turned out my daughter with a friend managed to hike off the hike out of the mountain the next day and save themselves. So they were fine. <laughs> Didn't get hurt. But anyway, it was, it was quite frightening. Another time I, I had uh, gallstone pancreatitis in the hospital. And it's very, very powerful. A little stone fell out of my gallbladder, blocked these important things, almost put me in intensive care. Extraordinarily painful. I was taking drugs 80 times more powerful than morphine. I was in there for like two weeks before I finally got cured. But I practiced taking and giving. And it transformed the whole hospital stay. It was so, so powerful. At that time, actually, I couldn't practice giving because I, the, the pain was so bad, I couldn't imagine giving any, I didn't have any happiness to give. <laughs> but anyway, it was a very powerful practice because again, it, instead of focusing on my suffering, my pain, I was thinking, oh, look at all these other people. They may even have more suffering than I do. Let me take away their suffering. And it just creates, again, it's this way of looking at things in a different way that is so, so powerful. So anyway, there's a lot of these various practices, which in the Mahayana path that are very, very powerful. 
And they, they all sort of revolve around these sort of altruistic ways of looking at the world. Okay, so having said that, let me quickly turn to emptiness. Let me just ask, are there any questions at this point? Okay, I've only got a little time left, so I'm gonna talk in emptiness. So emptiness is basically, in the Mahayana path, is basically an outgrowth of things that were called self, selflessness, or anatman in the original uh, teachings of the Buddha. So uh, as um, Geshe Sherab at our center has told me many times, when you look at emptiness, there's actually many, many, many different levels of, of various sophistication and refinement. So what I'm gonna teach you in just a few minutes, of course, is just the very simplest ways of thinking about it. But you should realize that there are deeper ways of, of going it. And in fact, it's the, the full realization of emptiness is said to be very, very profound and can actually only be penetrated under very deep meditative states because it's meditation concentration that makes your mind powerful enough to really penetrate subjects very, very deeply. So, so in, the, in the original way of looking at on Atman, basically the, the Buddha said there is no Atman, there is no permanent self. So what does he mean by that? Because most people would say, it's crazy, I'm me, I'm myself. <laughs> there is a self, it's me, I, I have my own self. And, and so, so the Buddha isn't denying that, but what it basically comes down to is when we say, I'm me, I'm myself, we're basically putting a label on a process because each of us is, is an evolving process. You know, we're born as young babies. We have a certain physical body. That physical body changes all throughout our life. You know, it gets bigger, stronger. It's constantly changing and eventually we reach full maturity and then we start declining and our body starts falling apart and we start developing an old body. So if you look at our body, our body is never the same for a second instant. It is, if it's at literally changing moment by moment, continually evolving, it's actually a process. So we can label it my body, but there's nothing that we can put our fingers on. You know, if you look at somebody who's a baby and you look at somebody that's an old person, you know, it's very hard to connect the two. The only way we connect the two is by continuity. Because if you know the person their whole life, you connect the continuity. And so that's what Buddha says is actually what our self is. Sometimes it's called a mental continuum because our mind is the, the part that will actually, so it's subtle parts of our mind are the parts that will actually be reborn. Our body is, dies at the end. We leave, we leave our body behind at, at the moment of death. So, so, so what the Buddha is certainly is basically saying is there's nothing there's no part of yourself and your mind is constantly changing. You know, the types of thoughts we have, the way we think, all of these things are constantly changing moment by moment. If you look at the way you think as an old man and you compare it as a young boy, there's, you know, they're so vastly different. You, the only, again, the only way you know that it's the same person is this continuity. You, you sort of follow it continuously in time. And so if, so if you are that person, you sort of feel yourself, oh, I'm me. But the way you recognize me is basically through this continuum. And so the Buddha said, we are all mental continuums. There's no soul that has Bob written on it. So I know it's me. <laughs> and, and it's like that, you know, when you, when you go on to your next life, you're reborn in other circumstances, different parents, you have different experiences. You know, it's as though you're a completely different person. So you're, you're a continuity of the same process but you, you know, there is no, there's no identity. There's no way, you know, if you, if I looked at you after a hundred lifetimes, there's no way that I could really identify which was the you that was you a hundred lifetimes before, because you've gone through just all of these different experiences. And in fact, when most people say, who am I? They write a biography and they just write down all their experiences because it's that continuity of all of our experiences, which is how we normally have our identity. And so that's when Buddha said, there's no anatman, that's what he meant. There is no, there's nothing permanent. There's just this flowing consciousness. And so, so this is somewhat different than forms of Buddhism. So in Buddhism, there's some forms of Buddhism that says, well, there is this universal self and we're just little pieces of it. And, and the, the way to, in, in some forms of Buddhism, they say the way to enlightenment is just to recognize that we're all the same 
thing. We're just little different pieces of the same thing. It's not that in Buddhism. Buddhism, there are separate consciousnesses which have their own continuity. One moment of consciousness leads to the next. However, you know, it, it's like they're empty. That's where you get this notion of emptiness. They're empty in the sense that there's no stamp or anything that identifies you as you. There's just this continually evolving process. It's like thinking of a, a river. So if you look at a river, we say, okay, this is the river. We give it a name. We say, you know, this river is very familiar to me. But if you look at it in detail, it's all this water flowing past. And the water that's flowing at this moment is different than it was five minutes ago. It's a different piece of water. So in a certain sense, the river is changing constantly. It's always changing. There's different water pieces of water. Sometimes it's dirty. Sometimes it's clear. You know, it can be full, bigger river, smaller river. It's just constantly changing. Yet we give it this name. We give it a specific name of a specific river. And so it's that way for the self, Buddha says, is that when we look at ourself, we give ourselves a name. I call myself Bob, but I'm really just this continually changing process. And then, and, and this relates to this whole notion in Buddhism of impermanence. Everything in samsara is completely impermanent. And that is really, really deep. You really got to get that. Once you get that sense of impermanence, the reason why it's connected to the sense of self, our self is impermanent. Every moment, we're a different person in a certain sense. So when we're reborn, it's not that big a deal. We're just, our consciousness is just continuing on. This process just flows on. But it's not as though we've lost anything because we never had any identity or actually absolute person to begin with. And so once you get this, it's very, very helpful. And it's this deep insight that helps you stop all your negativity. Because what good is it to achieve a lot of wealth if you're just gonna lose it. You can't hang on to it, it's all impermanent. And there's no permanent self that can be permanently happy. So, so in samsara, there is no permanent happiness. The only permanent happiness is to escape from samsara, to be liberated from samsara. Those are states where you can be permanently happy because they're outside of this flow of impermanence. Inside in samsara, there is, there is no heaven within samsara. You just go up and down. You, you achieve godlike statures. You screw up, create negative karma, fall back down, create positive karma, go up. You just recycle back up and, up and down forever. And the only way to, to get any kind of permanence is to achieve these various forms of enlightenment, to escape the whole system. And Buddha said, you can do this. He says, I know you could do this because I've done it. Uh, however, again, I would say that what's, you know, so again, once you start thinking about this, sometimes people get depressed. They say, oh, this is too big a goal. I'll never be able to do it. And again, I always say, don't worry about it because you can make yourself happier moment by moment. So if you focus on making yourself happier moment by moment, you'll achieve this bigger goal eventually. And, and also too, you know, I always say that People get hung up. Oh, I've got to get this spiritual tool or something. I've got to achieve tantra or I'll never get enlightened quickly or so. You don't have to worry about it. You know, if you practice being a good person, practice a spiritual life, you will create the good karma that you need to get spiritual help to achieve higher states. And you'll eventually get there. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, so maybe that, that's about all. I, and, and the emptiness in the Mahayana path is basically a continuation of that same, those same sorts of ideas, of uh, just realizing that there is no permanent self, that in a sense, we're all empty. I mean, we can be anything because, you know, you know, you know if I had a fixed nature, then I could only be what that fixed nature is. So if I were evil and I had a fixed nature of being evil, I could never become good. And however, because we're empty of any fixed nature, because we're just this continually flowing process, we can change into anything. And in fact, what we can do is remove all our negativity. And, 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 and so, so they often say that it's because of emptiness that the spiritual life is actually possible. Okay, so that's, I think, enough for emptiness. Uh, so let me just very briefly introduce Tantric or Vajrayana. So as I said, Tantric or Vajrayana is said to be the quick path to enlightenment. And essentially what it is, is what makes it the quick path to enlightenment is you more quickly eat away 
at this egotism. So it's even more powerful than mind training. So, you, so one way to look at it is it's just like a specialized technique within the Mahayana path. So tantric or, or it has both names, tantric or Vajrayana, Vajrayana. Uh, or yeah, they're, they're, those are just two synonyms for the same thing. But on this path, essentially you develop very, very, it's just, a, it's a very powerful Mahayana path. So it doesn't exist within the original teachings of the Buddha. The Buddha, the original Buddha did not teach the tantric or Vajrayana path. Uh, in the Mahayana schools, there are tantric deities, uh, tantric Buddhas who are said to have, you know, transmitted these teachings of how to do it to very deeply spiritual people. Um, and they, and these, these teachings are extraordinarily powerful. And, and they can even be, uh, and, and they go deep into your mind. In fact, if, if you're really heavily practicing these things, this is a place where it's really good to have a guru because some of the meditations can go so deeply that they can sort of, I don't know, unearth some sort of deep parts of our psyche. And so they can actually be slightly, a little bit dangerous if you're not careful. Um, uh, part of the reason why this tantric or Vajrayana path has to be a part of the Mahayana path is because it's only possible to do it with a bodhicitta motivation. So if you don't have a bodhicitta motivation, you cannot practice tantric or Vajrayana practice. Uh, because, I mean, you can, in principle, go through the steps, but it won't work. It won't be powerful. You need something powerful like bodhicitta in order to drive this very powerful engine. The other thing you need is you need an empowerment. So you need a special blessing on your mental continuum. So you usually have to go somewhere to get some tantric or vajrayana empowerment. Uh, there are different levels of tantric practice. Um, there are some that are given to many people, what's called action tantric. There are basically four different levels, which I won't go through. The most common one that's often given to lots of people, been giving, it's been given many times at our center, uh, is action tantric. And these are usually tantric practices associated with Avalokiteshvara, Manjushri, others of these Mahayana de Buddhist deities. And, and essentially, when you have this action level of tantric Buddhism, it enables you to do the spiritual practices associated with Avalokiteshvara or Manjushri or whatever uh, in a more powerful way that moves you quicker through the spiritual path. Um, and and so, so what do these things involve? And the highest level is called highest yoga tantric. And this highest yoga tantra exists in different forms and you can get different types of empowerments with different types of um, tantric deities, often called yidams, uh, things like uh, Baruka, Vajrayogini are, are two that are familiar to me, but there, there are many different types of tantric practices and, and each one has its own specific spiritual, and, and this is where you really get into a lot of religious ceremony. So how does this work? So in Tantra, again, it all involves, it's basically a mind training. It's like all of Buddhism. It is a form of mind training. And in the high, I'm only gonna talk about Hayash Yoga Tantra. Uh, in Hayash Yoga Tantra, there are uh, two different levels, um, uh, generation stage and completion stage. The generation stage is the easier level. Although actually in tantric practitioners often practice both simultaneously, the way we do in all of Buddhism, we're always practicing all things simultaneously. So we're practicing training and bodhicitta at the same time we're practicing and morality and other things. So we're always doing all of these practices parallel. But in terms of just thinking about it, logically the generation stage comes first, it's a easier stage. And basically the generation stage in a nutshell is you, you imagine yourself as the actual tantric deity that you are studying. So if Vajrayogini, a female tantric deity, is the one, the practice that you're doing, you imagine yourself to be Vajrayogini. 
And it doesn't matter whether you're a male practitioner or a female practitioner. You know, once, once you're a Buddha, really gender doesn't really matter. <laughs> you're a perfect being. So, so anyway, so, so if you're doing Vajrayogini practice, you imagine yourself as that deity. And you try to imagine yourself as that deity 24 hours a day, moment by moment. And so the way to think about it, and this is an emptiness comes into uh, tantric practice. In fact, the, the deepest levels of tantric practice are called the, uh, the union of great bliss and emptiness. Because you generate huge amounts of great bliss when you, you're generating huge merit. So you generate huge amounts of great bliss. And you use that bliss conjoined with meditations on emptiness to achieve very, very deep insights. And, and it's, those, it's that sort of thing that drives you to full enlightenment. But at any rate, on this generation stage, you imagine yourself to be a Buddha. And so, so here's where emptiness comes in. So if you imagine yourself to be a Buddha, so if you imagine yourself to be a Buddha, then you're practicing like a Buddha. All of your actions are the actions that a Buddha would take. So you have great compassion. You, you know, you have, you're, you're trying to generate in your mind exactly the same state that a Buddha would have. So if you generate all exactly the same states of mind that a Buddha would have, what's the difference between you and a Buddha? There is no difference. So if you could actually generate the full mind, you know, which would be a completely pure mind of a Buddha, you would be identical to a Buddha. And that's this notion of emptiness. Within emptiness, anything is possible. All you have to do is generate it. You know, you can, you can develop an, an empty, because of emptiness, you, it is possible ultimately to generate any mind. In practice, of course, you can't do this. So we so, so we we do, of course, a simulation. So we try to do we try to generate this being, this Buddha, as perfectly as we can. And of course, we're in perfect being, so we're actually not a Buddha. So so when you're doing tantric practice, you aren't actually a Buddha, but you try to imagine it as strongly as possible. Because when you imagine it, it sort of drives you to accomplish it closer and closer. So it's just a very powerful technique. Imagination is extraordinarily powerful. And it's used in all different forms of Buddhism because, because, because if you can imagine something so strongly that you actually generate that state, it's, there's no difference. So, so, so imagination plays a very powerful role in developing bodhicitta, for example. I mean, we, gen, we, we imagine loving everyone, even though we don't really quite do it at the moment. And that helps us in bodhicitta. And it's the same way in this tantric practice. So generation stage has this notion. And, and this is where it comes in in action tantric. When you're doing, for example, the practice of Avalokiteshvara, the, the Buddha of compassion, which is said to be the Dalai Lama. Uh, when you generate, when you do those spiritual practices, if you're doing it in a tantric or Vajrayana way, you're imagining yourself to be Avalokiteshvara while you're doing the practice. And again, you're using this powerful influence of imagination in your thing, which again, supercharges your spiritual practice. So I can't give you, you know, I'm giving you this very sketchy thing, but this is just sort of the flavor of it. That's all I can do in a few minutes. And the other higher stage is, is uh, completion stage is harder to describe because here you sort of get in, getting into this sort of woo stuff, you know, uh, spiritual bodies, uh, chakras and uh, you know nadas all, all of these things that actually it's somewhat the terminology is, is somewhat similar to uh, some forms of Hindu tantric practice but there is this notion that we have a spiritual body a sort of immaterial body if you like so associated with our material body we have a spiritual body that goes along with it and in Vajrayana practice, you have channels, winds, drops, things like this, which are spiritual things, pure spirit. And you do very deep meditations on these things. And through doing very deep meditations on these things, there are very powerful techniques for purifying your mind. And this is the actual very, the, the, the sort of more dangerous part, because you, when you're doing these things, you're sort of going very deeply into your psyche. And so these things are extraordinarily powerful, extraordinarily blissful, and but extraordinarily powerful. And it's, these, it's this power that can 
really, especially this completion stage that can drive you to full enlightenment. And in fact, what the way it works for full enlightenment is that by doing these types of meditations, you can move into the, the right chakras and so forth. You can move your mind into the right parts of the spiritual body where it becomes completely pure. And at that time, you develop perfectly pure concentration, no distractions. So you have no negativity in your mind. And if you have no negativity in your mind, you have no distractions, the most powerful mind possible. And then you use that to meditate on emptiness. And when you meditate on emptiness, then that wisdom achieves full enlightenment is how it works. Uh, another way of looking at that is sometimes it's said that people become fully enlightened at the moment of death because these very subtle minds that you experience in this completion stage practices are the same types of minds that appear at the moment of death. It's said at the moment of death that our mind our gross mind absorbs into a more subtle mind, which is a subtle mind, same, similar to a dreaming mind, the subtlety of a dreaming mind. And that absorbs into a very subtle mind. And it's this very subtle mind, which they teach in Mahayana Buddhism, is the mind that transmigrates and carries all your karma. And again, but it's, it's a continuous process. It's not a permanent thing. It's con even our very subtle mind is a continuous process. But this very subtle mind uh, appears very briefly at the moment of death before it starts regenerating when you're reborn. And, and so it goes from there out to, very, to subtle, to gross, and which and then you're in your new body, or you can, there's an intermediate states also, but too much to go into here. But anyway, so, so that's the way it works. But it's said that, that for most of us, I mean, this happens every time we die. But we waste it because it happens so quickly and we don't know it's there. We don't know that this very subtle mind is appearing, so we can't use it. So in another way of looking at this, uh, the completion stage is, it can also be like practice for the moment of death. Because in some of the Vajrayana, some of this completion stage practice, if, if you go into it very deeply and you're very powerful, very hard to do, but if you're a very deep practitioner, it's said that you can... Uh, sort of go into this very subtle mind. You can, you can actually absorb your gross mind into your subtle, into your very subtle. And then this is how you achieve enlightenment. You use that very subtle mind to meditate on emptiness and you become enlightened. So you, can, so you can do that during this life or you can use it to sort of practice becoming aware of all of these very subtle minds so that at the moment of death, when this very subtle mind appears, you spot it right away, and then you use it at the moment of death to meditate on emptiness. So at the moment of death, you become fully enlightened. So that's that's why it's said that this is the quick path to enlightenment. So that's sort of the, if you like, the techie process of how it works. <laughs> I mean, how it really works, you know, it's beyond all of this, of course. But that's, you know, this is what how people talk about it. So that's basically just a crude idea. So everybody thinks that tantric and Vajrayana is all about sex, and there is some sexual things that sometimes arise, but the real goal is really achieving these very, very, these very subtle minds, these very pure minds, these very powerful minds, and using those for very deep meditations on emptiness or achieving enlightenment. So anyway, I think I should probably stop here with this. Again, I've, uh, I, I can only hint at these things a little bit. So let me just stop here and ask if there's any questions about anything we've talked about today or anything in Buddhism, actually. I mean, the whole point of these courses, these are intro courses. So the, these are courses where anybody can ask any questions. So this is more of a comment. Okay. Um, there are some of us who I, you know, I would ideally love to be able to look at everybody as my mother. However... Yes. It, it, you know, not, not too uncommonly, I have, a, have had a difficult relationship. Yes. What I have found very beneficial is instead recognizing that I have been everybody's mother. Okay. So if somebody distresses me, that happens, um, I, I kind of remember, okay, what did they look like as a baby and how did I feel toward them? Yes, that's And good. it's much it's very productive in terms of being able to channel bodhicitta toward that person. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a perfectly good process. You know, I mean, in Buddhism, Buddhism is always about being practical, doing what works. And that's the way that Buddha taught. And so we shouldn't get hung up on following these traditional paths. I mean, you, you could go off and start your own spiritual group. <laughs> Buddhist groups used to teach. I mean, this is how these various groups start off. There's some spiritual person that comes up with this idea. Oh, if you look at it this way, it can be very beneficial. And that's perfectly valid. You don't have to, you know, you should do whatever works for you. You know, and, and in fact, in your spiritual path, path different things will work at different things and especially I, I don't know if you've been a real mother I mean if you have been that probably be a very helpful thing for thinking of it this way but uh, but as a parent you know I can I completely see the power of this sort of thing I mean I have two daughters so I completely see the power of this way of thinking it's absolutely true you know if you think about everybody's if you if you've experienced parenthood and it's been a positive process for you, you know, thinking of everyone as your children is extraordinarily powerful for developing affection for them. Absolutely. So I would say, yes, go with it. You know, it's like, there's a lot of people that have trouble with the mother meditations, you know, but again, I would say, don't get hung up with it because it's really a trick. It's a trick for generating affection for people. And so if you have some other way of generating affection for people, like thinking of yourself as a mother, I would say go for it because it's doing the same, it's having the same effect, it's working in the same way. So it's perfectly good to do that. I would say go for it. <laughs> I'm all for it. Okay. I any other questions or comments? Is that helpful? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, most uh, everything you've said has been quite helpful, Bob. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, is there any other questions? I mean, I've thrown a lot at you, especially in this last class. So I went through a lot of things. But I mean, part of the purpose of this class is just actually to throw things out at you. So you've heard it once. So then the next time somebody talks about it, it becomes easier to understand it. You, you have some crude back of your mind sense of it. And then when people, somebody talks about it in more detail, then you can broaden your understanding. I mean, almost everything I've talked about, every little tiny bit, every five minutes of today's talk, whole courses, you know, six month courses are taught on these various things. So I can't give you all the details. So I just hope to give you just sort of a feel, sort of a rough intuitive feeling for how it all works and why it might make sense or why it might be good to do these practices. Because a lot of times people go into courses and they learn these techniques. They'll learn bodhi. They'll go through all the bodhicitta motivations, or they'll go through tantric teachings and learn how to do. But they never actually know how it works. They just have. They're just taught. Well, I, you know, I just got to follow. This. It's like a cookie cutter. It's like, you know, doing a, a recipe in the kitchen. You know, I throw this these ingredients together. I bake them at this temperature, and then the end result is this wonderful cake. And I think it's it's actually helpful to have some idea for how how it actually works or or a way that you might think about it where it might make sense, where it might be helpful. So I think when you're doing these practices, it's actually good to have that sort of sense. And that's what I've always tried to figure out as I've gone through all of these Buddhist practices, I've always tried in the back of my mind, I say, how can I think about this in a way that it makes sense to me? That I can, it actually looks like it can accomplish what it's supposed to accomplish. It isn't just some kind of Mag magical spiritual, you know, religious ritual or something like that. Because in Buddhism, everything is done for a purpose. Nothing is wasted. Everything has a purpose. It's just often a lot of times nobody tells you what that is. <laughs> Sometimes it's very hard to drag it out of them too. Because especially in the Mahayana practice, there are things that are sort of secret. Like the, Ma like the Vajrayana Tantric is, is originally supposed to be secret and only taught to a few people. Uh, but nowadays, it's often taught widely to people. Whereas, interestingly enough, the original Buddha said, you know, I don't have any secret teachings. I mean, he had a, he had a funny terminology he called closed fist teachings. He says, I don't do any closed fist teachings. I mean, I don't, you know, close my fist around some of the teachings and hold it close to my chest and only teach it to my closest associate. The Buddha said, you know, I'm here to keep everybody from suffering. I don't have any secret teachings. I teach everything. So, which I think, which I find is quite interesting. But in the Mahayana school, there are some teachings, although to be fair, some of those, the secretness around those teachings is because there's the fear that they are such powerful teachings that if people just went willy nilly into them, 
that they might actually receive from some harm from them if they didn't actually have somebody to guide them through them. So there is some kindness in the Mahayana. It's not just, I'm being secret to be secret. <laughs> it's more like, you know, let me check your spiritual level and see if you're up to it before I teach it to you, because otherwise it may overwhelm you or it may not be good for you. It's more in that sense, I think. So, okay. So is there anything else that, something that has bothered you your whole time, you finally have a chance to ask it? <laughs> so, okay. If not, I've run over the time a little bit, which I think is okay. And so I'll, I'll close out on these things. And, and if, if it's gone too fast, they are videotaped. And so you can go back and listen to them again. And sometimes people find that very helpful. And this beginning course, like I say, I have to run through everything extraordinarily fast. So I can't, so I have to really, I can't give as much explanation as I would like. I try to give as much as I can because I, I find, I think people find it helpful the more concrete and specific you can. But there's only so many things you can teach in an hour and a half. So I have to be. A little bit cautious so so otherwise I, I i thank you all for for joining and hope to see you again in future classes thank you so much okay thank you all i appreciate it having you all it's about nine, nine.